Good afternoon. We are so glad that you are here today to join us at the Van Andel Institute Public Lecture Series 2023 Parkinson's Update. What's new? What's next? It's great to see you all on a rainy day. And as I was chatting with the scientists, we had the opportunity to talk about what makes this event special. And it's because today, hopefully, they are going to share some of the breakthrough research that is taking place right here in this building. They have teams upstairs working to help figure this disease out. And it's exciting and also kind of gratifying to know that we have top potential and top talent right here in Grand Rapids that's working on our behalf. So I'm excited today because you are going to hear from them and I hope as you are listening that your heart is filled with hope because they're working for us. You know, each year around 90,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and those numbers are expected to rise. Today, we're going to hear from two of our top VAI scientists who are studying this disease. They'll give us an inside look at how they are working every day to better understand Parkinson's and identify promising new treatments. Today, we are joined by Drs. Darren Moore and Laurent Rabon, who will guide us through the latest developments in Parkinson's disease. After the presentation, we'll have a time for questions and answers so please hold those till the end. And those of us who are uh, joining virtually, feel free to use that chat function and send in your questions, and we'll get to those as well. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming. We'll start with Dr. Darren Moore and then Laurent. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Darren. Great. Thank you, Miranda. And uh, thank you all for coming out on a rainy day. I know it's, uh, it's not pleasant, but uh, great that you could be here. And so, um, so I'm uh, Darren Moore. I'm the chair of the Department of Neurodegenerative Science here at the Van Andel Institute. And so um, today I, I have a very simple goal. I want to try and cover briefly Parkinson's disease. What, what is it? What are the key aspects of Parkinson's? And then a little bit about some of the research we do here, which is mainly based around the genetics of Parkinson's disease. And then I'll tell you about two initiatives that we have going on right now, which is called the MIND program. I'll explain what this is in a second. And then the International Link Clinical Trials Initiative. And many of you may have heard, heard of this. And this is a very kind of exciting thing for the Institute. And then uh, finally, I'll hand, hand over to our other expert today, Dr. Uh, Laurent Roybon, who will tell you all about induced pluripotent stem cells, OK? Uh, we can keep this informal if you want, so if you have any questions as we go, feel free to heckle, uh, throw something, or just, just put your hand up and I'll try to answer as we go, so we all, we all stay um, uh, informed. So um, Parkinson's disease uh, is uh, a disease of the brain. It's a common movement disorder. We all, we all kind of know this, but it's also very common, so it's the most common movement disorder. And it really afflicts people, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the over the age of 65, but it can also affect uh, younger people too. And those, those are more kind of genetic forms of disease. And when we think about the brain, this is the human brain you can see here, or part of it, a slice through it. We have this circuit that we study in the lab. This is, a, this is a neuron projecting here into this region of the brain, and this neuron can carries dopamine. And this is kind of the circuit which defines Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's, what we have is this circuit degenerates. You can see now it's degenerating and you have a lack of dopamine. And that really today is the mainstay therapy for Parkinson's disease. So we know that um, if you lose dopamine here with Parkinson's disease, one of the common therapies is to replace that dopamine. So this is levodopa or L-dopa. And so this is where we are today. And I want to tell you a little bit later about some of the clinical trials, which are really quite exciting. The, the other feature um, of the Parkinson's brain um, is what we call a, a Lewy body. This is a, a protein aggregate that accumulates in the brain in some of these affected neurons in this part of the brain and elsewhere. And it actually contains a protein that we work on here at the Institute called alpha-synuclein. And um, it's thought that this protein is, is toxic and, and you know, moves throughout the brain and um, uh, contributes to de degeneration. So this is one of the, one of the uh, proteins we study. Um, in terms of understanding what causes Parkinson's disease, it's very hard to uh, look at out in the environment and understand environmental factors. So what we tend to do is we turn to uh, more clear-cut cases where we can say uh, there's inherited Parkinson's disease in families. This is about 10% of all cases. And we can study, uh, identify those genes, and we can study the function of those genes. 
And the reason we do this is because those genes are, um, provide really exciting and interesting therapeutic targets that we can, we can go after uh, with, with drugs. And that, that's really the whole basis of what we do here in the Institute. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about genetics uh, very briefly. Um, there are families with Parkinson's, 10% uh, of cases, but the other 90% of cases, what we call sporadic Parkinson's, they don't have a family history of disease, but they also have a contribution, they do have a contribution of, of, of genes. Okay, sorry, I'm getting to grips with this clicker. They have a contribution of, of genes, and um, th that's actually very important for understanding the causes of those sporadic cases as well. So if we think about Parkinson's, you may have seen this slide before, and we think about the causes, we can think about the environment. There are many things in the environment which we think are associated with Parkinson's or linked to Parkinson's. We don't know if they're causal, but we know that there's some strange association. For instance, Parkinson's is more common in, in males than females, but females also get the disease. Uh, there are things like things that you've heard of, like pesticides, dairy consumption, traumatic brain injuries, different infections or pathogens, and also things like diabetes and melanoma, which have been associated with Parkinson's. We just don't know why. Uh, we don't really have the details of how they cause disease. But there are also things that are, are um, uh, uh, protective, we think. You know, that actually if you, uh, there, there's an interesting idea that tobacco usage and caffeine consumption actually are protective in Parkinson's. We don't know why. People are trying to figure out exactly what, what it is about these two events that are protective. And things like ibuprofen that we all, that we all take uh, are also linked to protection in Parkinson's. That's not to say any of these things, if you go out and do them, will protect you, but there's, a, there's an association in large populations with some of these factors. Um, genetics is a, is a huge component of disease, so I, I told you there are single genes that we know of uh, that, that are linked to Parkinson's disease. We found variants or mutations in those genes, which we study in the lab to understand what they do. But we also look at the other common form of Parkinson's, the 90% of people uh, that have sporadic disease, and there are, there are genes that play a role in that disease as well. Um, but probably, the, um, probably one of the biggest factors is age. So Parkinson's is typically a disease of, of, of age, getting older. Uh, and so we don't really know what it is about age that contributes to Parkinson's. But there are, there are a lot of interesting studies trying to look at aging mechanisms and how they may link, uh, link to Parkinson's disease. OK. So if we think about genes, now I'm not trying to, uh, you don't need to remember these names. OK. This is purely just for illustration purposes. But when we think about the familial causes of Parkinson's, that would be these genes here, right, in red. So these are very rare in the population, but if you have a, a variant in one of these genes, you'll likely get Parkinson's in your lifetime. These are the ones we study in the lab, and these are the ones we think make potentially excellent drug targets. So we, we are working in the lab to try and understand, for instance, this gene here, LLRK2, LARP2 we call it. Uh, there's actually trials going on. I'll tell you at the end, there's trials going on in phase three right now to try and turn this protein off uh, and see if it um, prevents Parkinson's. So this is a very exciting time now in, in, in the field of Parkinson's where we can actually now take genetic causes of disease and try to develop therapies around them that will hopefully treat many different people. If we think about the, the sporadic form of Parkinson's, that's the kind of common form, we have a number of genes which contribute to the risk. They don't cause the disease, but they contribute to the risk, and it's a very small amount of risk that they give you. So there are 90 genes or 90 variants in these genes that we know of, and somehow they're all kind of collecting together in certain people to increase your risk by a small amount, say, uh, you know, a 20% increase in risk. So this is kind of how we think about genetics, and um, in the lab we study, uh, you know, in, in the lab here, in my, in my lab specifically, we study these genes. Uh, there are, they have interesting names, VPS35, LOC2. Um, but some of them you'll notice uh, in the case of LARC2, for instance, it contributes to uh, familial disease, but it also contributes to the sporadic disease as well. So this makes it a very interesting uh, drug target because it, it's involved in many levels of risk for Parkinson's. And so then we like to take all these genes and say, what, what do they do? And, and what, what genes do is provide the instructions for proteins and uh, for making proteins. And proteins are the functional unit of a cell that does all the work, okay? Genes don't really do anything, they're just the instruction manual. So it's the proteins. And we try to understand how do all these genes kind of fit together, or all these proteins, to actually impact the cell. And so in my lab, what we do is we study this pathway called the endolysosomal pathway. This is the garbage disposal system of a cell. Essentially, things are, waste is made in cells that needs to be removed before it builds up and becomes toxic. And what we've noticed in Parkinson's over the years is that many of the genes that are linked to Parkinson's disease, either the sporadic form or the familial form, 
actually kind of coalesce on this pathway at different steps. And so in the lab, we try to study all these intricate steps of this pathway. This thing here is called um, the lysosome, and this is the waste disposal system of the cell. So all of these genes kind of feed into the lysosome, and then some of it feeds out of the cell to remove toxic, uh, toxic uh, products. So this is what we do in the lab. We're trying to understand how this pathway and all of these genes are somehow uh, causing Parkinson's, and there's a lot of details that go in here, uh, but we're, we're actually making good progress. Um, and we use this to develop models and uh, understand, um, you know, different animal models to understand exactly how, if you have a variant in one of these genes, it causes disease. So I also want to tell you a little bit about what we do here in the, in the department. So this is the Department of Neurodegenerative Science. Uh, many of us in this department work on Parkinson's disease. Um, so, for instance, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work we all do, but this is our faculty here. Each of these uh, faculty run uh, independent research labs, and um, as you'll see in a minute, this is Laurent Roybon. Uh, he's our newest member of faculty that joined um, just earlier this year. So, in terms of Parkinson's disease, we also work on other neurodegenerative diseases, but in terms of Parkinson's, we're really interested in trying to understand the mechanisms that cause the disease, because what we want to do is develop a therapy to prevent the disease or to stop the disease before it progresses. We don't want to wait until we have Parkinson's. We want to look, try and look before that. So we're trying to understand, you know, what are the causal factors of Parkinson's? Uh, it could be genetics. It could be some environmental trigger. We study all of these things. I just told you about a cellular pathway called the lysosome. We study this in the lab. And then we make some interesting disease models as well, uh, one of which is... Um, you'll hear about in a minute from Laurent, which is iPSCs. These are actually derived from your own body, so skin or, or blood, and, and you can actually um, study them in a dish. Very interesting model. Um, we're also interested in not just the mechanisms, but the, 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 the brain itself. So how does Parkinson's affect different circuits in the brain, and how does this alpha-synuclein protein that's part of these Lewy bodies, what does this really mean for disease? What does it do? How does it spread throughout the brain? We have a huge kind of in initiative here to to understand what, what that pathological feature means for, for Parkinson's disease. Um, we're also interested in therapeutic studies here. So we, we develop a lot of um, rodent models and other types of models, and we're testing constantly um, therapeutic uh, targets. So for instance, some of those genes I told you about, the LOC2 gene, we're actually trying to understand if we can turn that gene off in an animal model, can we prevent disease in that model? And can that then provide the evidence for going into a clinical trial? That's the type of thing that we, we do here. And then we're also interested in biomarkers. So can we take something from your body, blood sample, something from like a, a spinal tap, um, and can we use it to understand aspects of the disease or to track the disease, the progression, or the effectiveness of a clinical trial? Um, so we do this too. So um, that's, that's the research side of things in, in, in the department. Um, we also have two initiatives that I told you about. One is called the MIND program. So this is a, uh, a large initiative we started about two and a half years ago, but it's really to focus on neurodegenerative diseases in West Michigan by collecting samples from patients as well as a number of other things. Um, but it's really right now focused on West, Mich West Michigan and mainly it's focused on Parkinson's patients, uh, different forms of Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism, not, not other diseases, but we later on will expand to dementias and Alzheimer's. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do with this program um, is uh, take, for instance, a, a patient, a Parkinson's patient. We can collect many different samples from patients while they're still alive, and this is one of the advantages. And what we like to do here is right now we're collecting blood from patients, um, but we can also collect other things like skin biopsies to make these stem cells that Laurent will tell you about in a second. Um, we can also collect urine. We can collect CSF from the spinal cord. And eventually, when people die, we can also uh, have a mechanism to donate your brain that we can study. I mean, part of what we do here in the lab is we, we work with models, but we also study the human brain that has Parkinson's disease uh, and other diseases as well to understand you know, what's happening in the brain when, when somebody dies. And so the idea here is to collect these biosamples. Um, and what we've done is created a biorepository where basically we're banking all these samples away. We're also begun um, collecting brains from uh, donor programs. Uh, we're starting one soon in, in uh, Michigan through Gift of Life, so we can collect brains when, when, you, when, a, when a person dies of Parkinson's disease so that they can donate their brain to research and we can study it. The other thing we're trying to do is with these samples is understand 
you know, I talked about genetics at the beginning, but what, what does it look like in West Michigan? No one's really ever studied um, the kind of genetic architecture or the landscape in, in this area, because uh, uh, there is no large major research university in West Michigan, uh, really apart from, from the Van Andel Institute. So what we're actually doing is taking samples from patients. Right now we're partnered with Corwell Health, and we're taking uh, uh, samples, and we're actually taking the DNA out of the blood and essentially sequencing it and looking at you know, whether or not um, those people have some of the genes that, uh, some of the variants in the genes that I said were linked to Parkinson's disease. So we're trying to understand exactly what it looks like in this area. Yes? Can I ask questions right now? Yep, go for it. Yep. Um, not from humans, no, but we do uh, have some, uh, there are some people here studying aspects of that and also in the field in general, but just, um, we don't have a program set up to collect that at this point, but that's a, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, and so the other thing we're doing with these uh, patient samples is if we collect skin or blood, we can actually make these um, pluripotent stem cells. So we created a new platform to be able to take cells from humans or patients that are still alive and actually turn them into brain cells. And Laurent will tell you exactly what this is. This is, he spent his whole career working on these, these cells and so he's the, he's the world's expert on iPSCs. Okay, so um, this is quickly about the iPSC platform. What do we wanna do is um, take samples from patients, typically a skin biopsy or blood, what we can do is that will be a stem cell, so it can turn into any other cell in the body. Um, obviously, it's a skin cell at this point, but what we can do is reprogram it into what we call a, a stem cell, an iPSC, so a, a sort of a skin fibroblast into an iPSC. This is now a stem cell, and then we can turn that stem cell into a brain cell, any brain cell that we want. And then we can study that in a dish from, from humans. We can't really study the brain of a human, obviously, only when they die and we collect the brain post-mortem. But what we can now do is study the actual neurons in a dish uh, while they're still alive. So that, that has a lot of advantages. And what we'd like to do with that is use it to identify disease mechanisms, um, try to understand what's happening in those brain cells, but also to use it for screens of um, pathways and, and drugs that may actually um, prevent some of those uh, disease features. So we've established uh, an IPSC platform at the Institute. Um, we recruited Laurent Roybon to run this platform. He's now a member of faculty. Uh, and so we now have the capacity to do this in, in the Institute. And we're developing the capacity to screen these IPSCs and other cell types to understand uh, what, the, what the disease features and mechanisms are. Finally, the, the last thing I wanna tell you is about our partnership um, with the Cure Parkinson's uh, in, in London in the UK, uh, where we've, uh, they, they've developed a, uh, an initiative called the Link Clinical Trials Initiative. You may have heard about this before, but essentially it takes over 10 years to discover a drug and take it through clinical trials and build all the evidence it requires to uh, develop a novel drug and, and get it approved by things like the FDA. And so the goal of this program is actually to uh, take drugs that are already FDA approved or European drugs, EMA approved, um, and essentially repurpose them for Parkinson's disease. So they, these are drugs that are not developed for Parkinson's initially, they, wor they work in other disorders, but there's some kind of evidence that they might be protective in Parkinson's. And so this is a quicker way, right? They're already FDA approved, we don't need to go through all that regulatory approval. All we need to do is take these drugs, put them in clinical trials and see if they have an, an effect. And then the pathway after that is very quick because they're already FDA approved. And so um, this is a uh, kind of initiative, it's an international initiative we take these drugs, we have, we have a committee that prioritizes these drugs and actually selects the ones that go into trials. And then Cure Parkinson's is a charity and essentially they have a mandate to then move this drug into clinical trials. So we think we can speed up some of the, um, the trial development time. But this also complements what I said at the beginning, which is we study genes so we can, they become great targets, we can develop drugs to them. There are many drug companies doing that right now. And so we have these kind of two complementary approaches. One is these kind of like understanding the mechanisms of disease through genes and then developing drugs to those, but also repurposing other drugs that are out there that look like they could also have promising effects as well. So that's kind of, that's kind of the, the two-pronged approach that we have uh, in the Institute. And so um, where do these drugs come from or how do, we even, how do they even appear on our radar? Uh, essentially, we have a process where we mine the literature 
cure Parkinson's do this, or we recommend drugs, like in the field, we work with some of these drugs. So they end up being funneled through a list of agents, and then we provide a lot of evidence about how those drugs work, how they may work in a Parkinson's disease model, or a patient, what type of clinical data. Are, are these drugs that we should be putting in humans for Parkinson's disease? Eventually, we end up with a list of agents, and, and then the Link Clinical Trials Committee uh, meets and discusses, this is a panel of, a worldwide panel of experts, uh, meets and discusses these drugs and then prioritizes them for moving into clinical trials. So here's just some examples of where we are right now with the Link Clinical Trials Initiative. Um, normally, originally it was set up to kind of be a phase two or phase one. I should tell you what the phases are. So phase one is a safety trial. Is the drug safe? Phase two is an efficacy trial, but it's a small population of Parkinson's patients. So does it have any indication that it works? Phase three is a much larger trial involving many more patients, up, typically up to 500 or 1,000 patients. And these trials are long because you have to wait for people to see how they progress over time. So typically a trial takes two years of watching uh, a patient who takes that drug and how they, how they do on the drug. So we have some drugs in phase three right now. We partner on these drugs with Cure Parkinson's. So Ambroxol is actually a cough medicine. So you wouldn't think that would have anything to do with Parkinson's disease, but strangely enough, it seems to have uh, uh, interesting effects in, in animal models. And this is a very unique drug in that it was actually, um, its target, the target of this drug, seems to be one of those genes that I was showing you at the, at the beginning called GBA1. I didn't mention it or point to it, but it seems to be uh, targeting specifically one of the genes we know is involved in Parkinson's. So this is now recruiting for phase three. We have another dream, uh, gene. I told you at the very beginning, uh, sorry, another drug, I told you at the very beginning there are links between um, things like diabetes and Parkinson's. We don't really know the nature of that, but we now have a lot of diabetic drugs or anti-diabetic drugs, such as exenatide, uh, liraglutide, and lixisenatide. These are all uh, actually approved for type 2 diabetes, but they seem to have some beneficial effect in Parkinson's animal models and also in Parkinson's patients in phase two clinical trials. The phase two has already been done by Cure Parkinson's. It had looked like it had an interesting effect or potentially beneficial effect, but you can't really have it approved until you go through a, a larger phase three trial. So exenatide has now made it into phase three. Um, and so the, these are the types of things we're doing. These are drugs that just were not developed for Parkinson's. We're not even sure quite about the mechanism, but at the end of the day, they're safe, okay? So if they have a beneficial effect in patients, um, we're not really too worried about what the mechanism is because there's a, there's a pathway to approval. We also have things like bile acids, natural bile acids, UDCA. This is uh, used for treating gallstones and liver cirrhosis. This is now also in phase two trials. So we have a bunch of drugs here that just you know, are to, to many other things, type two diabetes, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, antidepressant drugs. So this is kind of a new way of um, trying to speed up the um, drug development for Parkinson's. This is where those trials are right now in terms of the landscape and the ones noted on this slide are the ones we kind of co-sponsor. So this is how Van Andel Institute is, is trying to take uh, an active role in you know, the international clinical trial landscape. Um, we don't have a hospital here in our, in our building, obviously, so we can't do trials. We don't have a clinical trials unit, but we can partner with people that can actually do this in Parkinson's patients. And so that's what we do. So we're very hopeful that some of these uh, trials will be successful and, and we won't really know for exenatide until um, earlier in 2024. And as I said, Ambroxol now is, is actually um, just, just getting going. So we'll have to watch this space. And finally, my last slide is, um, um, I just wanna point out where this fits in the clinical uh, trial landscape for Parkinson's, okay? So uh, this is a rather complicated slide, but what you'll see is the lower half of this circle, these are symptomatic therapies, okay? So these are therapies like levodopa or L-dopa, which actually just treat the symptoms, but they don't treat the causes of the disease. The disease progresses, but you can alleviate some of the symptoms over time. There are so many drugs that are in development for phase one, two, and three uh, for, for Parkinson's disease. When you look at disease-modifying drugs, and now these are what we're interested in in Parkinson's, can we stop the disease? We can't probably reverse the disease, but we can identify it very early and stop it from progressing. And we're hopeful that some of these drugs will actually uh, be, uh, be uh, progress forward. And so you know, when you get to phase three, which is the final phase of drug development, you notice that there really aren't that many drugs at this point in time. But what you see is a few interesting things. Cure Parkinson's, uh, the linked clinical trials, we now see exenatide coming forward, so into phase three. But we also now see drugs that are designed to some of those genes I said at the very beginning. So this drug here, BIB122, is a LARC2 inhibitor. And these two drugs here, memantine and, and, and buntatap, 
is actually uh, targeting the alpha synuclein protein that forms those Lewy body clumps and moves through the brain. So we're now in a very exciting uh, period of time where we have multiple strategies to go after Parkinson's. But I should point out that none of these drugs, these disease-modifying drugs, are approved at this point. They're, but this is where we got to in the field, uh, and it's, it's very exciting. I've been working on Parkinson's for over 20 years, and I started most of my career working on this LOC2 protein, and now finally we have a drug in clinical trials, which is looking promising. But the um, LINK clinical trials also plays a very important role in fast-tracking other drugs with protective effects, like potentially exenatide and uh, ambroxol as well. So this is very kind of exciting times. So finally, I'd just like to wrap up and uh, remind you that we have a meeting here every year, an annual meeting called Grand Challenges in Parkinson's Disease. This is our symposium. This year, we'll be talking about pathophysiological mechanisms to therapeutics. It's pretty much what we talk about every year, but it's exciting. It's like, where is the field? Uh, a lot of the stuff I mentioned will be there. World experts are coming to this meeting to give talks. And accompanying that meeting is what we call the Rallying to the Challenge annual meeting. This is organized by the Cure Parkinson's. And essentially, this is mainly for patients. Uh, there's a lot of interaction between both meetings, but this is for patients and caregivers, uh, clinicians as well. So um, if you don't want so much science in your life, I recommend the Rallying to the Challenge. But if you want to hear the latest in, in, the, you know, in the scientific community, then you, know, you can come to both meetings, and I recommend it. And now I will uh, stop talking and introduce our next speaker, who is Laurent Roybon. And he is going to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about induced pluripotent stem cells. And um, welcome, Laurent. Stage is yours. Thank you very much, Darren. And thank you all for being here today. And uh, Darren gave a great introduction about Parkinson's disease and all the efforts that are being done at the Van Andel Institute and also uh, uh, abroad and in collaboration with, uh, uh, with different foundations. And, and today I want to take the opportunity to talk about stem cells, which is a model that maybe some of you have heard of, but this is something that now we have been implementing at the Van Andel Institute, and this is the model that we use because it's based on patient cells. And I think this is a way to go if we want to learn more about the disease, but also if we want to develop and look at the efficacy of uh, different treatments. So here, basically, you have two pictures. The first one shows basically how a stem cell is. It's a colony of cells that are growing all together. And the second one is what I call a mini brain. So basically, it's those first cells that were differentiated and which resemble basically the brain parenchyma. And in, actually, this uh, 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 mini brain, you do have the cells that are affected in Parkinson's disease. You have neurons but you also have cells that support actually those neurons, which are called the glia. So no need for me to remind you about the brain. This is a very important organ. Actually, it's protected by your skull. So that means that you know, the function that it's, uh, it's doing are very important. So basically, the brain is controlling our thoughts, memory, emotions, motor skills. And in Parkinson's disease, actually, one of the first symptoms that you have, it's this motor dysfunction. So you cannot initiate voluntary movements. And that's because the dopaminergic neurons are degenerating. They cannot release dopamine anymore. Uh, of course, this brain is very complex. You have a lot of circuitries. All the cells are connected to each other, but they are connected in a specific way, which actually will allow us to uh, uh, display all these uh, uh, you know, functions. Now, unfortunately, with age, the brain becomes affected. We are aging. So if you take, for example, the weight of a brain when we are in our 50s, it's 1.5 kilos. But when you are getting older, when you are like around 90, 90 years old, then it's 1.1 kilos. So it has reduced, actually. It has shrinked. And of course, now if you have a neurodegenerative diseases, you have lost even more cells. And those cells, they are like very important. So aging is an important factor. That's why we develop neurodegenerative diseases after the age of, uh, of 50, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease. Something else to remember is that one person out of five will develop a neurodegenerative disease. So if we are 200 today, 40 of us, including me, Darren, hopefully, uh, uh, we may not, but that's the sad reality. One person out of five will develop a neurodegenerative disease for which we have no cure. So we can help with the relief of the symptoms, but we cannot change, you know, at the moment, the course of the disease, which is something that we would like to do. And it's even 
becoming more and more difficult to think about trying to find you know, a cure, but there is hope for that. It's because I will show you actually this, the degeneration of those cells has started very early on before we get the diagnosis. And now, of course, you know that this is you know, an extreme burden for our society because we need to have healthcare. So neurodegenerative diseases, actually, they are marked by two principal hallmarks. The first one is the degeneration of specific type of neurons, which are important, uh, uh, for example, to initiate movement, so the dopaminergic neurons. But also, like Darren said, we have some waste that accumulates in the cells. And if you have waste that accumulates, then it's going to make the cells dysfunctional. So the cells that remain, actually, are not you know, fully functional. So we have to work with those two elements. And that's why nowadays, we don't call uh, uh, actually neurodegenerative diseases uh, uh, with the term neurodegenerative diseases. We call them brain proteinopathies, because not only in Parkinson's disease, but also in Alzheimer's disease, amyotrophy lateral sclerosis, we have this waste that does accumulate and make cells dysfunctional. So we have been working for many decades with different models. The problem is that those models, they were not perfect. So we have learned a lot about the mechanisms of the disease, and we know that there are specific genes, which then you know, will lead to familial Parkinson, that are involved in different pathways in the cells. So we have a target, and that's why Darren showed that some of now the, the clinical trials that, uh, that are ongoing, they are focusing on those targets, and hopefully they can improve uh, uh, the disease. But basically, they are not uh, uh, fully recapitulating what is happening in the patient brain. So most of the treatment, usually they are based on intuitivity. So we give to patients L-DOPA because we are missing dopamine. L-DOPA is the precursor of the dopamine. So the remaining neurons will actually transform this L-DOPA into dopamine. You will have more dopamine released. And then after, you can initiate movements much better. But one has to remember that actually a neurodegenerative disease is not a disease. It's a syndrome because we are all different. So maybe the Parkinson that one person has is a bit different from the Parkinson that another person has. And if you think in a, in, in a different way, for example, if one of my uh, uh, you know, ancestors or, or grandfather had Alzheimer's disease, my mother had Parkinson's disease, and if I'm meant to have Parkinson's disease, will I only have Parkinson's disease or a bit of Alzheimer's disease as well? So that's what is making you know, uh, uh, trying to understand a disease and trying to cure it very complicated. We have actually concurrent and concomitant pathologies. So when we look at the postmortem brain, you know, there is like there are general hallmarks, but there are also uh, co-pathologies. And these we don't always find them in you know all the individuals. So that makes the disease very complex. And also what we have seen now, after a decade of research or even more, is that it's not only the brain that is affected. We have neurons that are actually you know, running throughout our body. So that's why sometimes, you know, researchers are also talking about the guts and the brain, where would the disease start, and, you know, how other organs would be affected. So it's very complex. It's not only the brain, it's the whole body. So one of the best ways, actually, to study the disease is, is, is patients, because the patients, they hold the key to understand what is happening in them. It's maybe not a model that we would develop. This would help us to understand the mechanisms. But really, if we really want to understand what is happening in somebody that has Parkinson's disease, then we need to look at the cells of that person. The problem is that we cannot access those cells. Your cells are dying. We cannot take more of the, the cells that are in your brain. Otherwise, we will deplete even more cells. But what we can do is try to create a model actually utilizing your cells. And this is what uh, uh, some of the researchers have done, because, like I said before, when you have symptoms that appear, and this is not for Parkinson's disease, this is for Alzheimer, because it has been very well mapped out. You know that you have, for example, brain atrophy over time, and that you will start to get some clinical symptoms with mild cognitive impairment. But when you look at these are the decades of life, the pathology has started maybe two to three to even four decades before. And that's where, where it's, it's, it, it becomes you know, very interesting to, to, to try to think that, OK, maybe if we have now models that reflect what is happening in your cells, we could study how the disease actually initiates and then how it progresses. And actually, here there is a black box because maybe you know, it started even earlier. If you think about a familial form, a gene that is mutant is already expressed during the development. 
So maybe actually the disease started very, very, very early on. So this is where this researcher, Professor Shinaya Yamanaka, came up with the idea of trying to make this model that would reflect exactly what is happening, the disease in patients. So what he did was to try to find a way to reprogram a mature cell, which is a somatic cell, so it can be a blood cell, it can be a skin cell, which is a, a, an aged cell, into a pluripotent stem cell, which are the stem cells that actually will give rise to an individual. So then you can really know what is happening early on in the disease. And he found that this is possible by actually overexpressing genes that are naturally expressed by stem cells. So then you can do this, 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 this workflow of trying to reprogram the cell, which normally differentiates, but now you, you re-differentiate it to become very young. So for that discovery, actually, he got the Nobel Prize. He is here on the left. So those iPS cells are generated from somatic cells, which can be taken from any individual by overexpressing what we call stemness factors or stemness genes. And these cells, they have the same properties as embryonic stem cells, which are actually derived from a blastocyst, which is here, and where we can see the inner cell mass that actually give rise to a fetus, and that fetus will develop into an individual. So that means that now we can have access to your cells when you are very young, so to speak. Now, these cells, they have the capacity to be differentiated into all brain cells and even other cells that are part of, the, uh, of an individual. And here we can generate neurons, but we can also generate the supportive cells, which are astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, which are also affected in the disease. So it's not only about the neurons that are dying, but it's also those cells that support the neurons. Those cells, they also become dysfunctional. Now, the advantage of this uh, uh, system is that we have access to an unlimited number of cells, of brain cells, to study a disease. And it's Parkinson, it can be Alzheimer, it can be many other diseases. And those cells, they have the genetic background of the individual they are derived from. So I can make iPS cells with my identity, Darren's identity, your identity. And what it does, uh, this model, is that it's allowing us actually to differentiate those cells and see how actually they become dysfunctional over time. This is something that we can do in vitro in a Petri dish, but we also have developed models where actually we can follow the development of the pathology in vivo. And this is where these cells and this model becomes very exciting because now you can study a human disease in the lifespan of a mouse. So instead of st studying the disease in a patient for 80 years, you can do it now in the mouse in two years. So, you know, it's, we reduce the time uh, uh, quite uh, impressively. So there are different applications on how we can use actually those stem cells. We can use them to repair the brain. We can use them to look for agents that would actually promote the survival of the neurons that are dying in our brain. We can study the mechanisms of the disease, and this is what we are mainly doing at the Van Andel Institute, but also we can look at how actually those cells, they could help us to recruit patients for clinical trial or to test the efficacy of uh, a treatment. So I will first start with the self-repair. So there are a lot of actually ongoing initiative that are trying to uh, do what is called regenerative medicine. So we know that dopaminergic neurons are dying in Parkinson's disease. So the first you know, thought that we could have is that, okay, let's try to replace them, transplant new neurons that could ensure the function of those that are dying. So what you can do is to generate iPS cells from an individual, differentiate those cells into dopaminergic neurons, and then after transplant them in the brain where the dopamine needs to be released. And the good news is that now the FDA has approved the first phase one clinical trial that was just maybe a week ago here in the US at uh, Harvard Medi uh, Medical School. So actually one of the first person that tried uh, a compassionate trial was Kwon So Kim, uh, also from Harvard Medical School, where he made iPS cells from one patient that he was uh, 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 um, uh, um, working with, and then they transplanted those progenitor cells into the brain, and so far so good, the cells, they could be there two years after they have imaged the brain of that individual. So now we need to wait a bit longer to see whether or not this has been helping actually the patient to have you know, a better motor recovery. 
So that is very, very promising. And those trials, they are ongoing also in Japan and in Europe. So there are different places in the world where, you know, this is a strategy that is being taken to try to help patients with Parkinson's disease. Now, the second thing that we can do, our second application, it's to study the disease in the dish. Like I said, you know, there is a lot of heterogeneity in the cases. We are all different. So what may happen to me may be different to what would happen to somebody else. So here is an example of how we can utilize those induced pluripotent stem cells. We grow them in a dish, we generate those mini brains, and then after we perform different biochemical assays to see where the dysfunctions dis dis locate. So here you have a picture of those mini brains, which contain neurons, so you see their cell body is marked in red, and then their projections are marked in green. And then when you analyze those cells, so here one individual cell, you can see that this function is all over the place. And that's what is making actually studying the disease very complicated. Because you don't only have one dysfunction. You have dysfunction in the autophagosome, in the endosome, the lysosome, the mitochondria, the nucleus. So, you know, maybe using only one uh, drug is not efficient because you have a lot of pathways that are activated in these cells. So maybe you would need at some point to combine different treatment. So we can use those cells as well to do some drug screening. And since neurons are dying, the first uh, application that we, uh, uh, we are doing is basically to look for factors that would promote their survival. So here is an example. You take those, I'm sorry, those IPSC, you differentiate them into dopaminergic neurons, and then after you will take many plates that have different compounds and then give them to the neurons to see whether or not they can promote their survival. Here what we can see is that cells were seeded on day one, compound A was given, none of the cells survived. Here cells were seeded also on uh, day one, we gave compound B, and then you can see cells that are surviving. So that is a good indication that this compound is having a neurotrophic effect. So it's promoting the survival of the cells. Now what needs to be done, it's to improve the efficacy of that compound and of course to test it in vivo because this is a work that is performed in vitro. So it's called screening. We screen for like uh, uh, having a reduced number of compounds that could have actually a therapeutic effect. So this is something that now the MIND program will be starting very soon. We have got robots and, uh, and, uh, and I think this is very exciting because it's not only performed for uh, 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 Parkinson's disease, but also for Alzheimer's disease and amyotrophy lateral sclerosis, so a lot of neurodegenerative diseases together. Now, I talked about, uh, uh, Darren talked about clinical trials, and, 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 and here it's something which is very interesting. Sometimes clinical trials are failing, and this is a reality, and they cost quite a lot. But they are failing not maybe because the drug actually is not working, it's because we do not respond to that drug. So imagine that since there is this population that we have and start with, it's very heterogeneous. So that means that maybe to cure one individual, we the drug will fail in five. And of course your trial will fail, but some people could have benefited. So can we find a way actually to select people who are going to respond so that the clinical trial will actually succeed? And this has been, you know, uh, uh, some kind of a headache in the field because uh, there is no way uh, uh, to see exactly what is happening in, uh, in the patient brain cells and how they would respond experimentally to actually a specific drug. But now since we have iPS cells, what we can do is to test the drugs in the iPS cells or in the neurons that are generated from them. So before, the way we were thinking was that maybe one treatment would fit everybody. The problem is that some people benefited from the treatment, the treatment had no effect on others, or you had like adverse effects. So of course, that makes the clinical try uh, uh, fail. So we have gone now towards one size fit all medicine from stratified medicine, trying to make subgroups of patients and predict this group will respond, this one may not, so we're gonna go for the clinical trial with that group of patients, to what is called precision medicine, because sometimes the only thing that you may need to do is actually to change the concentration of a drug and then it would have an effect. Or you need to combine drugs or simply to give like different drugs or different therapies to different individuals because we are all different and we respond in a different way. 
Now, hopefully, if we can include actually those data that we gain from working with induced pluripotent stem cells to the clinical data, then we would have a better outcome and a better healthcare. And that is the long term idea. So, here is an example on how we could address that. You can take patient iPS cells, differentiate them into neurons, and transplant them into the brain of, uh, of an animal, uh, a mouse, which we are working with in the lab, and then analyze the cellular dysfunctions of the human cells, which are here labeled in red. And you see that they are dysfunctional. But now, here you have the perfect, I would say, patient. Very small, you have access to its brain, so you can try, actually, to give a treatment, or you can try a therapy in the human cells in vivo. And that will bring confidence, actually, if the cells they do respond very well to the treatment, and here actually they do. So that would make me confident to say, okay, let's try this treatment and go for a clinical trial. So this is something that now we have been developing uh, 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 and that we are bringing to the Van Andel Institute, and hopefully I can convince you that here we can, for the first time, look at whether or not there is a target engagement in human cells in vivo before going to a clinical trial, and this is still experimental. So this is, to date, the most advanced model to study, actually, a patient disease and how, you know, it, the cells, they would respond to a treatment. So here is to, a, a slide to, uh, to summarize, basically, how the workflow is being performed. Of course, we're always happy to, uh, 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 you know, to work with uh, uh, patient biopsies, generate uh, induced prepotent stem cells, differentiate those cells into mini brain or different cell types, and then after use them for uh, different applications. And those were the four applications I showed you, patient stratification, trying to understand the mechanism, testing for neurotrophic compounds, and also for cell replacement therapy. And then once this is identified, then we can go back actually to the patient. So you know, it's a full circle. So we have started to do uh, to implement this work, and here are the researchers that are working in the lab, and this is performed in collaboration, of course, with the MINE, and it's integrated to the MINE program, and uh, uh, performed also with other researchers at the Van Andel Institute, not only for neurodegenerative diseases, but also for other diseases. So with this, I would like to thank you all, and, you know, I think we would be happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing. At this time, we will open it up for questions. We do have microphones available. Um, if you would like to go to those microphones, we also invite our virtual audience to join in, use that chat function you have. I'd like to get things started by asking the first question. Um, you know, we've heard a lot in recent years that Parkinson's disease is on the rise. I want to know why. What's happening? What has changed? Which one of you would like to address this? Uh -huh. I'll take that one, I think. Um, so it seems like it's on the rise, but it's not really. I think the problem is um, we have an aging population in the US, and so um, the proportion is just larger. Uh, also, previous studies haven't really counted very accurately uh, how many patients were affected, and so now a lar much larger recent studies have kind of got really you know, rather than guessing, they've actually kind of gone out there and counted who is affected. So it looks like it's on the rise, but I think we had we were unestimate, underestimated before, I think. Um, but, you know, still a uh, large number of patients. I think uh, 950,000 patients at any one time in the U.S. Uh, have Parkinson's, and I think that's predicted to go up to 1.2 million in, uh, in uh, 2023 because of the way the population is getting older and older. Uh, so not, not really increasing in incidence, just increasing in the number of people. Yeah. Yes, up here. Are there more early onset Parkinson's patients? Shall I take that? I'll take it. Um, not, not really, no. Um, actually, early onset Parkinson's is probably the, the lowest number of, of all Parkinson's patients, right? So. Typically with early onset disease before the age of 50, that's actually um, typically a familial disease um, and it's normally genetic forms. So they're not really increasing in incidence, but we are, we are uh, identifying them earlier and understanding a little bit more about them. So, but the answer is no, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Have at it, my dear.
So let me rephrase that so our online friends can hear as well. Um, are you seeing that the kinds of research you're doing and the, the type or the way you are doing this is actually spreading to all of the diseases as we research and look for cures or treatment? So or is it exclusive for Parkinson's? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So that's why I placed the slide for Alzheimer's disease because the model that we are using for Parkinson's disease can be applied to any neurodegenerative diseases because we know that less than 10% of them are uh, familial form and others are based on risk factors and also are idiopathic. So you can apply the same model, but it's not only related or, or, or focused on the brain, it can be you know, applied to any other disease. So you're absolutely right. This is a general model where actually we will use patient cells to be able maybe to tailor uh, uh, a treatment. Yes. Yes. Feel free to use that microphone if you want to just run right up there. Thank you. My question goes back to, I think, the very first slide, but can you comment, and it might not be simple, but are there specific or different types of mutations or variants in LARC2 that are causative versus risk factors? And does that mean that only some people with LARC2 variants uh, will benefit from the drugs that are in phase three trials? That's a great question. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yes, the answer is yes. So there are um, some variants in LARC2, which if you have them, you will definitely get disease in your lifetime. But the most common variant, which we call G2019S, actually um, has what we call age-related penetrance. So uh, maybe at the age of 50, you have a 20% chance of having, if you have that variant, you have a 20% chance of disease. But by the age of 80, you have an 80% chance. So as you get older and older, the, the chances of the, that variant gives you disease uh, increase. Um, so some people can escape disease. Um, Sergey Brin, the founder of Google, has a G2019S LARC2 mutation. He doesn't have Parkinson's disease at this point in time. Uh, we don't know if he's ever gonna get it. Um, his mother has it as well. And so there are plenty of cases out there where, where, where exactly you're right. And, and it gets a little bit more complicated as well. There's other variants in LARC2 which, um, increase your risk by even a lower amount. So you may never get disease. They're just kind of associated with slightly larger number of cases. So it's a, it's a little bit complicated with that gene, but also with all genes, actually. I, I'd say LARC2 is a little bit of a special case, but um, many of the genes work in the same way. So yeah. So we're asking about the connection between Lewy bodies and the genetic stuff you're studying. Are they two separate things or are they connected? Okay, I guess I should back up and say what I didn't say is the first gene ever identified for Parkinson's was the alpha-synuclein gene. So it causes mutations in alpha-synuclein cause Parkinson's disease. That's true. If you take the common sporadic form of disease, the, the most consistent genetic risk factor for sporadic disease is also the alpha-synuclein gene. Right? So it causes familial disease, it causes, or you know, increases the risk of sporadic disease. But it also happens to encode the alpha-synuclein protein, which is part of Lewy bodies. So that's a, a very special gene that we study in the field because it, it works at three different levels. So, but like I said, the protein is what does the damage. So when we look in the brains of Parkinson's patients at death, they have Lewy bodies and they have a lot of alpha-synuclein. We don't really know if those Lewy bodies are contributing to the disease or whether they're a result of the disease. Like the cell became dysfunctional and the Lewy body appeared or the other way around, like the Lewy body appeared and killed the cell. Remember when we look at them, they're in surviving cells. So that cell is still actually alive. So we still don't know as a field, but what we can do is take that protein, that aggregated alpha-synuclein protein, inject it into the brain of a rodent and we can recreate aspects of the disease. So it's, uh, we do actually study, um, you know, we do study what you said, right? So we're we are trying to understand what does a Lewy body really do and mean, and we study that in the lab, uh, actually in my lab, and uh, Laurent studies that in iPSCs. Um, but yeah, it is a genetic and a protein linked to the disease, so it's, it's kind of interesting. But certainly that's a major interest here, yeah. Who is Lewy body part of dementia or Parkinson's? 
So actually, uh, so basically, you would find those Lewy body not only in Parkinson's disease, but in what we call synucleinopathies, which are diseases where we will find, you know, aggregation of alpha synuclein. So that includes uh, dementia with Lewy body, Parkinson's disease, and multiple system atrophy. And if we look at multiple system atrophy, you may actually find those aggregates of alpha synuclein in a different cell type. Now, why do we have this aggregation in a different cell type? Uh, this is something that, you know, we, uh, we still don't know. But yes, yeah, so it, it not only happens in Parkinson's disease, but other synucleinopathies. And you also have alpha synuclein aggregation as a copathology of cases of Alzheimer's disease. So really, there is a problem with the clearance of, of, uh, of proteins in your degenerative diseases. Like the mic? Have you found any correlations between say, um, IBD, Crohn's and colitis, ulcerative colitis, and then Parkinson's as well. So you get one disease, and then as a bonus, you get Parkinson's. Have you found any connections? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so let me just say we don't work on that. Uh, but as a field, um, I can say that it's still not clear whether one disease causes the other disease. So even if you have diabetes or irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's, colitis, we still don't know. Um, what we find is that some Parkinson's patients have a higher incidence of those diseases you mentioned. Um, actually, what we found with the LARC2 gene, I keep going back to this, I'm sorry, but like we, in the LARC2 gene, it actually can increase the risk of Parkinson's with certain variants, but it, with other variants, it can increase the risk of things like colitis uh, and Crohn's disease. So it's kind of, we, we think, this may relate to the immune system and autoimmunity causes many diseases, but may have a role in, in Parkinson's. But I can't say that in any definite way. These are, um, this is epidemiology, right? So it's a very strange science where you take a group of people and say, you know, what, what are the risk factors that led to their disease? And so we see these associations. We don't understand why diabetes and Parkinson's are linked, melanoma and Parkinson's. Crohn's, but these are super interesting links and sometimes we can tie them to gene function, like a particular gene that does both of them. And so people, there are plenty of people in the field that study uh, immune cells and their impact on the brain, invading the brain, and, and you know, we're, we're, that, that's a big area of study. People are studying the impact of the gut in general and how it communicates to the brain via the vagus nerve, uh, whether that's playing a role. But these are experimental studies, right? So we, we don't do this in humans. Um, we just find the association in humans and then try to take it into the lab and make it a bit more simple to, to study and understand. So it's moving that way, definitely, yeah. Yes. So this question is regarding the type of drug that is currently being given doesn't seem to be working. Are there a variety of options available or do you need to stick with the one drug? I think what you find in some of these cases where you have an onset of what looks like Parkinson's and then followed quickly by psychiatric issues is that sometimes, I'm not a medical doctor, but, so, but it can be a misdiagnosis. There are many things that look like Parkinson's disease. Um, Frontotemporal dementias look a lot like look look a lot like Parkinson's disease, but they have very early psychiatric symptoms. So it's very hard for a movement disorder specialist sometimes at the very beginning to to know this. And so what they end up doing is saying, okay, you definitely have the signs of a motor disorder. They give you levodopa. They do it for a while to see whether you know that's your main thing. And if other things come in, it could be that she has an atypical form of Parkinson's disease, which has extra symptoms. Those are quite rare, or uh, another disease. Or it could just be very early manifestation of psychiatric disturbances. And what, what you need there is a, a separate medication that would treat those symptoms. And so this is, this is the Parkinson's is a moving target, right? So you start treating the motor symptoms, but other things will, as the disease spreads, other things um, come along for the ride, dementia and constipation, things like this. And so there are treatments for some of those other things. But we don't really have a treatment that definitely works for dementia. There are new therapies that just got approved, but... Um, but for psychiatric issues, 
uh, there are separate set of medications for those. So that may just be a, um, an idea about getting on top of the symptoms as they arise with the, with the neurologist. Yeah. Anything from our online? We have room. Nothing good. Okay. And let's do one more. Uh huh. No, no, um, but it has uh, a similar effect on the body, but it acts through a completely different part of the brain, but it will produce like a fight or flight response, but dopamine also can produce, you know, can initiate movement. So they, they do look similar, but they're, they're actually not re related, no. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say about that. Yes, Is that, yeah. one more. You said ASO? ASO. Right. So ASO that's, considered uh, for Parkinson's. So that's an antisense oligonucleotide. Yes. Um, actually, it was on my clinical trial slide. So I think in phase one clinical trials right now, I told you the LOC2 protein needs to be turned off. And one strategy is they're using, uh, so antisense oligonucleotides uh, remove the gene or remove the, the instructions for the gene from the body. And so you don't necessarily want to do that uh, throughout the entire body. So it's actually being given uh, intrathecally into the spinal cord. So we can actually just remove LARC2 from the nervous system. Um, we've studied LARC2 for a long time. We don't think it really has much of an impact on the nervous system if you remove it, in, at least in animals. And so uh, Biogen is a drug company who have this clinical trial for uh, LARC2 ASOs uh, happening. And, and that, that they also have the LARC2 inhibitor as well. So they're actually... They have both drugs for LOC2. One is in phase three, but one is in phase one. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's happening. Um, I guess phase one, we, we don't know, but um, I think in, in rodents, it's definitely safe. So we'll see, yeah. Let's give our doctors a big round of applause. Thank you so much. I also would like to thank each of you for joining us today. Uh, what great dialogue, what great questions. If you would like to stay engaged with the Institute, we'd love to have you do that. You can visit the website, sign up for mailing lists, of course, follow on social media to find out what's taking place. I also want to remind you that they did talk about grand challenges in Parkinson's. That event is coming here, and we encourage you to join in that conversation as well. Um, we have another public uh, lecture series taking place September 13th. We were talking about it yesterday, and it is exciting. If you have children or grandchildren currently that are in public education, uh, this conversation is about AI, artificial intelligence, in our classrooms. How are schools using it? How do they plan to use it? How will it impact how our kids learn? And what, what might they be missing out on once we move to that? So sign up for that one as well. Again, it's totally free, and that is on September 13th. A reminder, on December 7th, we'll have our final public lecture series of the year, and it will be a panel discussion covering environmental impact on our health. I promise that one's going to be great as well. You can find out more information on VAI.org website. Sign up. Get involved in the conversation. So appreciate you coming today. And one more time, let's give a big round of applause for our guest speakers. Thank you. And you are dismissed. Thank you.